Hello and welcome. This is the Mutiny Investing Podcast. This podcast features long-form conversations on topics relating to investing, markets, risk, volatility, and complex systems. So I swear I'm not doing this on purpose, but I figured out, I think my last three out of four guests have been University of Colorado at Boulder alumni. (laughs) So oh, that's got, fantastic. Got another one here. Just please tell me you didn't uh, major in philosophy like the other two. I, I did not. Uh, I was an economics and business major. But, uh, you know, regardless, the, the Buffalo herd runs uh, runs very strong in finance. So, uh, you know, glad glad to hear that you're you're taking care of the buffs. Yeah. So what why did you end up going there? Because you grew up in the, the Bay Area, like the South Peninsula. Is that right? Uh, of San Francisco or? I did. I did. I grew up in the Bay Area, but actually my, my parents uh, went to and met at Boulder. Um, and my dad had actually seen it as, as a young guy. His family had moved uh, from uh, sort of the uh, Lake Michigan area um, to Boulder for a year um, because my uncle had some uh, asthma issues. And so they moved there. The whole family fell in love with it. They went back to, you know, just outside of Chicago. Uh, but all three of the brothers, including my dad, ended up going to Boulder for school. And my, my grandmother actually got her master's in music from Boulder back in the 1950s when they were there. So you're a commodity or research equity investor. So uh, most people, if you hear Colorado, they would think Colorado School of Mines, but you went <laughs> to Boulder for business. So like, what was the, uh, your kind of trajectory until you found your way into the kind of resource or commodity equities? Yeah, it was it was a little circuitous. We've got you know, a bit of a family background in, in that my mom grew up on a cattle ranch in West Texas, just outside of the town of Marathon, hence the name of my firm. Um, so there was always a little bit of that. We don't have a bunch of oil wells. It's not Dallas uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but but that's so. I, there's a little bit of resourciness in my family background. Uh, but I started off at the Franklin Templeton Group covering um, consumer products. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was back out of, out of college. I'd always been interested in the securities industry uh, and buying and selling stocks. But, uh, you know, with the sector that I started with, again, who was the CEO of Colgate Palmolive. And so I covered consumer products and cable for a year, but then actually started gravitating towards energy. Uh, and then, you know, so from there it was, uh, you know, I, I found it actually worked really well with my natural kind of inclination of analytical skills. You know, I'm not good at guessing what multiple goes on a consumer product, a, a process by which I can try and buy a dollar's worth of assets for something less than that. Um, that was kind of music to my ears. So, uh, you know, Franklin, I helped launch the Natural Resource Fund back in the kind of late 90s, uh, and then have been doing kind of stuff more or less on my own ever since. Got it. So we've, I know we had kind of discussed before privately, but like you think like the seminal moment for you is 2008 and what you learned about like resource and commodity equities in 2008. So can you kind of dive into that a little bit of like what your kind of epiphany was from the 2007, 2008 great financial crisis? Absolutely. Uh, so it, it was a, a sort of a, a revelation via a two by four to the head. Um, you know, it was a wonderful setup for resources. That was a really good decade for resources. Basically, 2002 to 2007 was kind of glory days, kind of across all of energy and mining. Um, you know, the underlying demand pull was was really great because of the you know Chinese industrialization and you know expansion of uh, of demand there. Um, you know, you started to see additional supply come in, but you know, look, the stocks were cheap, inflation was picking up, uh, the world looked pretty good, and then all of a sudden, the 2008 uh, you know global financial crisis came in and swept the legs out from under it. And in fact, the resource stocks went down more than everything else, uh, despite the fact that they were the cheapest things going in. Um, and so, you know, the epiphany there was that that the environment which is good for natural resource equities, which is rising commodity prices, rising inflationary backdrop um, is inherently really destabilizing to broader markets and can bring about levels of volatility that leave nothing unscathed, including resource equities. So, um, you know, it's it's it was a tough lesson to learn, uh, but it, it sort of shaped the way I thought about resource investing after that. So, 
the first step, you know, beyond that was to sort of focus my efforts within the resource sector on a more stable group of companies. If we're going to have a, you know, really super volatile sector, you know, let's invest in companies that are more stable, free cash flow generating, good balance sheets, and that sort of thing, as opposed to exploration companies or, you know, over levered companies that, you know, are going to go up huge if commodity prices go up, but probably go bankrupt if they don't. Um, so that was really the thing that I changed in 2010 with the current strategy that we're running. Uh, and then on top of that, we started to do a lot more, and this is where you and I started talking, a lot more of the way of risk management and kind of layering in long volatility on top of that, um, you know, starting in kind of 2019. Yeah, and we'll get into that, like, unique hedging structure that you have within your portfolio. But I was thinking, I was, uh, you know, I love your your quarterly newsletters, and even your monthly updates, uh, because I have a general romanticism, I think, for, like, real assets and commodities. I don't know if it comes from, like, reading Mark Rich's books or T. Boone Pickens, or, like, I just think about the, you know, swashbuckling Canadians, you know, going around the world to mines to 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 check out, you know, fertilizer crops, et cetera. And like, it might be, it's very different for you though, in sense that maybe with resource equities, um, is it a lot of travel or is it be, or is it more computerized these days where everything you can be kind of, kind of done from home? So I did a lot of travel earlier in my career, you know, visited a bunch of mines, did the helicopters out to the offshore drilling rigs. <laughs> um, you know, I've had all the tchotchkes to, to show for it, you know, boots and hard hats and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, at some point you see a bunch of mines and you, you kind of see most of what you need to see. And if you're going to do a lot of early stage um, investing in companies that are very much in a kind of pre-production phase, then you still have to do that due diligence or you have to have someone do that for you. And I've had geologists on retainer and, you know, people who, who kind of spend their lives bouncing around between these different projects around the world. Um, but I will say the focus on more mature companies, you know, ultimately the arbiter of whether, you know, a, a deposit is uh, you know, profitable or not is the cash flow statement. Uh, and so I, it's nice to be able to not have to make sure that, you know, they're building in the right place or they've got room for a tailings dam or, you know, they're not going to be too close to a watershed or it's, you know, seems to be too far away from a certain facet of what they need to support the mine. You know, by the time I'm investing in companies, typically all that stuff's been kind of sorted out. So it's less travel than it was. And certainly the post-pandemic world where you can kind of get management on a, you know, half hour, 45 minute Zoom anytime you want has also made that to some degree easier as well. Do you think it's a... It's a certain kind of like young man that that appeals to. Like I just think about maybe it's my love of James Bond films or I'm a sucker for any film that takes place in at least like five countries. So like if I was in my 20s and found like resource equities or mining, I would have been one of those guys like traveling to third world countries, like you said, looking at a hole in the ground, but like thinking it was the greatest thing ever until like you said, maybe you get a hard and grizzled veteran and then, you know, you've seen one hole, you've seen them all kind of thing. But like it, it may, I think it appeals to like certain people or like you were saying, even like things, saying things like cash flow and real assets. Uh, appeal to a very narrow segment of the populace, I feel like, sometimes. Yeah, I mean, look, there's, there's, there's certainly a romantic tangibility to everything that goes on here. And, you know, if I was just in, you know, Morocco uh, a couple of weeks ago and sitting in one of their central plains where a great Roman outpost was built uh, at the center of their olive oil industry. It was the only major Roman outpost that was away from the Mediterranean Sea. Um, and it was because uh, of the incredible lush, uh, you know, agriculture that was going on there. So this is the stuff that's been building the building blocks of humanity for, you know, 2000 plus years. Uh, and so I think inherently it, it has to appeal to you from a, you know, kind of base level, um, you know, but that said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go out and visit the, you know, Nigerian oil fields anytime soon. I'll leave that to somebody else. <laughs> you're not going, you're not going up the, uh, to the heart of the Congo, but the, um, I think about, you know, when you talked about the, the resource equities, the first thing that always comes to my mind, and I'm, I, I'm sure I'm probably not unusual as this, is like gold mining stocks, right? And people YOLOing, you know, Canadian gold miners, because that's where they think they can get unbelievable leverage for like a, a gold price play. Um, but that's not what you're talking about. You're talking about like looking for actually like mature companies that have broad diversification. And just I just want to like clarify that difference a little bit. Yeah. So, you know, look, gold stocks were gold stocks or Internet stocks before Internet stocks were. So, you know, the, the, the amount of rank speculation that you see in a great resource cycle can be really intoxicating. Um, you know, that said, it's, it's, it's a really hard way to build a business over cycles because most of that stuff goes out of business in the down cycle. Uh, 
Um, and so what I have found, and this was really, again, this is the outshoot of 2008, the lesson there was if you looked at a short list of resource companies that were flat or even up a little bit in 2008, they had a pretty common set of characteristics. Good balance sheets, high free cash flow generation, flexibility to the point where they could actually buy back their own stock or buy back their debt opportunistically, or even make acquisitions without the assistance of outside capital markets, without the banks and the equity markets opening up to them. They were, they were there organically. Uh, and so, you know, concentrating on those types of companies gives you a lot of margin of safety in an industry that typically doesn't give you much. So it is not perfect in any way, shape or form. Um, but it's it, to me, it's really interesting in that people are like, oh, you know, so those are the boring companies that you don't want to own in the upcycle. The, the, the truth is, is that these types of companies can actually build convexity through the down cycle by retiring their debt at a discount, by buying back stock, by buying out competitors who might have complementary lands, buying them out on the cheap because their competitors got over their skis. Flip side of that is that the companies that you think you want to own in the up cycle oftentimes have to give away a lot of that convexity with diluted financings in the down cycle. Um, so uh, what we found is that you know, we do a really good job of keeping up with the markets on the upside. We just end up protecting capital a ton better on the downside. Right? Over the course of cycles, that really makes a difference. Man, you just, I'm going to steal that and use that for a pitch deck for, for what we do. So like when you and I are so philosophically aligned, it, it's it's pretty ridiculous. And then what's it, even more interesting on that upside too, is like if you have a highly volatile like gold miner on the upside, you have to monetize perfectly, right? Like, and that's what people miss a lot is like you have to really, um, there's a lot of luck involved there. Where like you said, if you're, if you're riding these more, um, you know, large conglomerates with diversification during that up cycle, um, you don't have to be as, as perfect with your timing for rebalances or, or readjusting your portfolio. And I think that's what people miss a lot of time too, is not only mitigating that downside, but like people forget that, you know, the upside creates problems too, especially like you know, maybe getting later, it's like optionality, right? If you have convex put options yeah. and they're, you know, deep out of the money, you better monetize those perfectly or else, you know, you, you may have missed the whole convexity party in protecting the rest of your portfolio. So it's an exceedingly difficult. You know, normally I like these conversations to be evergreen, but I do want to timestamp this just because we're going to talk about different sectors and everything. So we're, we are recording this August 23rd of 2022. Um, and so I was going to talk about grains first, but I think to talk about grains, you have to talk about fertilizer. And, uh, you know, part of fertilizer is obviously, you know, synthetic fertilizer and the Haber-Bosch process. Um, but kind of tell us what you're seeing across like fertilizer markets around the world, especially what's, what's uh, you know, when on the Ukraine, what was publicized in Ukraine versus what maybe reality on the ground is kind of maybe a bit different. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a really interesting, really multifaceted environment. I just think there's a lot of uh, misconceptions about it. And, and I think there's a lot of complacency about it right now. People got really concerned right after uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, and so there's a lot of pension here. But quite honestly, the, the groundwork for the fertilizer bull market, um, this was ongoing for a year before Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, and the, 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 it, basically that was driven by longer term decline in grain inventories, which are it's effectively that is driven by an acceleration of grain demand from the pre 2000 levels of like 1.2, 1.3% a year to something more like 2.3, 2.4, 2.5% a year. And that's really a complexity of diets. The more animal protein you put into your diet, the more grain that requires, uh, as opposed to just eating the grain itself to be able to, to, to feed you. Um, and so you started to see uh, fertilizer markets tighten up post 2020. There was not a lot of incremental capacity put in, um, you know, uh, hydrocarbons that go into the process, particularly natural gas, were super cheap. So, you know, you had this kind of excess of supply and all of a sudden the grain markets start to tighten up. Fertilizer starts to tighten up as well. And then you have the European gas crisis here. Again, the European gas crisis predated, and in many ways, kind of, I, I think we're, we're the birthing parent of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. That's what gave Putin the leverage that he had. But this European gas crisis that came about in kind of September, October, November of 2021, um, all of a sudden you had the entire European fertilizer complex that takes European natural gas to make uh, nitrogen fertilizer. Um, went uneconomic, you know, when nitrogen or red local gas prices went up by two, three, four fold, all of a sudden they had to shut down because it was uneconomic for them to produce fertilizer because their input costs had gone up so much. 
So all of a sudden, the global fertilizer markets tightened up. So you know, then all of a sudden, you start to have these follow-on effects where farmers are going to apply a little bit less fertilizer because it's so expensive, but that's going to make yields drop. And so you're you're basically you're you're putting off some expenses today that likely lead to even tighter grain prices happening in you know in six to nine months once we get through another harvest cycle. So you've got you know so that's kind of the basis of what we see in the fertilizer market. We're primarily disposed towards the nitrogen fertilizers, but I think there's a re reasonably good story for um, for you know potash and some of the other things that are the other nutrients as well. Um, but, you know, then you have these other things coming in, which are, you know, really accelerates. You have this you know, sort of, I think, really maybe well-intentioned, but utterly uh, disastrous move towards reducing or banning synthetic fertilizers uh, that, and using organic fertilizers that has a disastrous impact on yield. So that's Sri Lanka. That's a number of places where you've seen it lead to actually political overthrows because it blows up the balance of payments because um, all of a sudden you don't have enough rice to support your, uh, you know, your population and all your export crops, you don't have enough of them to sell because all of a sudden your land isn't as productive as it used to be. So you've got that layering. And then you've got resource protectionism, resource nationalism, where um, as grain inventories start to tighten up, um, the com countries that have the ability to have surpluses and are typically the exporters for the world uh, are saying, well, you know, maybe I'll export a little less or maybe I won't export at all. So you've got this reflexive, George Soros reflexive, grains are tight, so people get more protective, so they hoard more inventory, so prices go up even more. This is the story, you know, again, I haven't mentioned Russia and Ukraine yet. This is right. all has been going on. Um, and, and, and that's what we all of a sudden throw Russia and Ukraine into the middle of. So it, it's, a, it's a really, um, I think, very complex, multifaceted market. But to me, it's one of the most convex opportunities in resources right now, because I just think there's just an enormous amount of complacency around it. Yeah, before we get to Russia and Ukraine, yeah, there's so many things I want to pull on that you that you just talked about. One is um you know, serendipitously, I was actually just watching a video last week on the potash pools in southern Utah. Have you ever seen those things? Like from an aerial view, they're amazing because like as the water evaporates yeah. over weeks, it creates these really vibrant colors. So if you look on it yeah. like a Google aerial map, it's like it's just this beautiful thing in the middle of the desert in southern Utah that I think that's like uh, 400 acres, I want to say that, that like some of these, these potash farms that are basically, you know, bringing it up from underground. And I think you can look at it. I think the town's actually called like potash Utah or something like that, but it was, you know, trying to, right. trying to have some, trying to have some domestic sources too, cause it's a, it's a very volatile compound too. So you have to be very careful and people have died in the past, you know, trying to, you know, harvest the different, uh, different combinations with potassium. But like you brought up the nitrogen fertilizers, you know, my, my understanding, please correct me if I'm wrong is part of the 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 protests in in the netherlands coming from those farmers is the idea is that nitrogen based fertilizers create like ammonia on the ground and after was it two to three days that becomes a volatile carcinogen but the way that the dutch farmers use it they don't they're not using the ammonia in that sense but so they're that's what they're kind of fighting against but is that kind of like the thesis or process of why they're trying to restrict their abilities to use nitrogen based fertilizers yeah i mean i think at the root of it i mean it's it's it is it is a global movement um, that is wholly political, um, I would argue anti-human, um, but it is, it, it is based on both the toxicity of it uh, when it's applied, but also the fact that it's fossil fuel based and therefore has a carbon footprint that goes along with it um, that is higher than using natural animal manure to be able to, to do the same thing. Um, so that is all well and good, it is true. The fact of the matter is, is that the Dutch farmers, with no regulation whatsoever, have actually reduced the amount of nitrogen toxicity that they, they've been emitting by 30% over the last four or five years, um, without any regulation, without any movement. So significant progress has been made. Uh, and yet you have this, again, we're seeing the same thing in Canada, this, this desire to, to kind of jump the shark and say we are going to righteously do this uh, and we're just going to you know eliminate this industry you know the netherlands is the second largest food e exporter in the world outside of the u.s um so this is not you know this is not you know taking a little a little player off the table it is significant you know you talk about throwing canada into that mix you know that's again that's another top five food exporter um it, 
the fact of the matter is, without synthetic fertilizers that have many, many, you know, they, they have quantifiable detrimental impacts on the environment um, that have been lessening over time and clearly you've been used in many parts of the country for 50 years or more. Um, so they have issues associated with them that we seem to be able to manage. But the fact of the matter is you can't feed over half the people in this world without synthetic fertilizers. You just can't. The map is, is not there. Um, and so trying to, to pretend that um, it's a viable solution to just go cold turkey on this stuff is just, it's, it, it, it doesn't work. Uh, and so I think the conversation needs to be a lot more sophisticated um, to be able to figure out the right balance. And that seems to be lacking from the dialogue today. <laughs> Yeah, nuance is always lacking from any dialogue, understandably today. And and part of that is, you know, that you have, you, realism is the way you're you're kind of talking about it. But I wonder almost if you if you take off your investor hat for a second, right? Both of us live in Northern California, which you know is frequently accused of, of very hippie tendencies. I think that's a historical lag. It's not quite like that anymore, especially with Silicon Valley. But one of the things I always, you know, we we have some of the best produce in the world. Right. And so I always go to the farms and, and visit and see how any, you know, the crops are grown to how the ruminant animals graze and all that, that that stuff. So what do you think about if you take your investor hat off for a second, though, the trade offs of, you know, you by using synthetic fertilizers, right, you might uh, increase the cyclical yield of that crop, but you may be destroying the permaculture for the secular yield of that crop long term. And I think that's potentially maybe the argument Sri Lanka is trying to make. But I'm just curious, like, you know, taking off of both of our investor hats, just how do you think about that in general? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I've got three kids. I'm, I'm all for making sure that the world that they deal with over the next 50 or 75 years um, is one that's habitable, as habitable as we have right now or better. Um, I think the evidence uh, of, you know, look, the Central Valley of California is the most fertile, productive place in the world and, you know, has people trade something all the way through it all the time. Um, and has been using fertilizer, one of the you know original places where fertilizer has been utilized extensively since, you know, again, since like the 1940s, 1950s. So I, I think the, the argument that, you know, somehow that they are, haven't seen them yet, maybe they will come. Uh, and so, you know, I think we have to be cognizant of that. Um, but I, to me, I, the, the benefits outweigh the risks, particularly when, you know, look, we as a wealthier society, you know, if we want to pay, you know, $3 for a tomato, uh, as opposed to, you know, a buck or whatever, we can do that. And that's, you know, that's, that's a choice that we make. Um, and I'm okay with that. Um, that is not a, uh, you know, a, something that one can impose upon 75% of the global population. They don't have that luxury. They really just want to make sure that the tomato or whatever it is, synthetic fertilizer um, is elemental in making that actually show up. And so, you know, I think, I think different parts of society have to make different choices and probably will make different choices. But at, at the end of the day, if we're going to look at this globally, holistically, world population wise, um, we just have to have a, just a, a, a much more balanced conversation about the path that we take, as opposed to saying, you know, we don't like what this might look like in 50 years. So let's cut it all out right now. Um, and then all of a sudden, the daisy chain of side effects comes along. And the next thing you know, you've got governments collapsing all around the world because they can't feed their people. Yeah, I mean, there's nuanced trade-offs all the way down. I, I usually bring up in the, the early 1900s, uh, a lot of farmers used to raise pigeons so they could harvest the pigeons for their bones, crunch them up, and, and distribute them fields. And a lot of people don't want to live like that anymore either, and they would think that's a torturous process. But then also, like you referenced earlier, it's like the the history of, of natural resources is fascinating if anybody wants to study it. Like, as I'm sure you're aware, it's like the Guano Wars of South America between Chile and Peru is the reason why Bolivia still no longer has a port, you know, because we were fighting for these abilities to grow crops. I mean, it's that 
that Malthusian bargain from, I think it was 1799 is Malthus. And we're still always debating it to this day. And like you're saying, without Haber Bosch and all these other synthetics, we wouldn't be able to grow the food to increase the carry capacity. And people can argue on either side of that, whether that's good or bad, but this is the world we live in. So there's a, there's a certain amount of pragmatism to it. But I want to go back to, before I get too afield in my, my ramblings, I want to go back to grains and, and the, cause that's what we were talking about fertilizer first and how that affects grains. But the way I want to use maybe grains in this scenario that you started to hint on already is everything that I don't think it gets talked about enough, but everything in, in investing is expectations. What are the current expectations, right? And did the numbers come in to uh, go above or below expectations? And it, so it's that tertiary effect of what really moves markets. And so you were already referencing about like the Ukraine is all we saw across the news media was it, Ukraine is the breadbasket of Europe. And if that, those grains get destroyed, everybody's screwed. So then it, just because of that news cycle and expectations, it seems like grain prices skyrocketed. And then the news comes in, it's not as bad as we thought. So then they tank. So I'm just wondering like how you like talk me through like Ukraine grains and then therefore how we think about expectations within the commodity markets. Yeah, so I mean, look, most grains are actually down year to date and they were up before Ukraine happened. So again, the market is more complacent today than it was in mid-February before the tanks started rolling, um, which to me is, is pretty remarkable. I think the expectation set, again, people, there aren't a lot of folks left who play the commodity game. Um, and so when Ukraine happened and broader market weakness was happening, all of a sudden you kind of had to be, had to have exposure to resources. Nothing else was working. Um, so, you know, energy and grains and all that stuff was. So you had a lot of people who, I, I think investors bought it because they felt like they had to be there. They rolled into DBA, the agriculture ETF. They rolled into, um, you know, Nutrien and Mosaic and all of these companies uh, with the expectation that, you know, it's just, I, I kind of have to be here. It's not because they had a really firm view of the long-term secular bull case for grains, it was, God, I'm getting killed everywhere else if this Ukraine thing really goes sideways. I need to have exposure that's going to work. So the, the, what came out of that was, you know, look, the market system is, or the world, the global food system is very sophisticated. We pull down inventories elsewhere that we, you know, to be able to cover the balance of what was supposed to come out of Ukraine. But really, the impacts are, are really, you need six to nine months to really figure out the impacts because that's a typical you know, kind of crop season. And so we haven't seen the impact of reduced fertilizer usage. We have not seen the impact of what looks like now pretty difficult growing conditions in China, in India, in parts of the U.S. Midwest. All of these things are coming together. And when you, know, when you get crop estimates for... Uh, how, how what yields are going to look like. They're pretty good at adjusting for weather, um, although they tend to be kind of, they're, they're momentum chasers in some ways. So, you know, they, they're high, high, high until the numbers get them marked down and then they rush down to meet them. What they are not very good at doing because it's been a long time since fertilizer prices were really this high is adjusting for the impact of reduced fertilizer application. And I think we just need to go through a growing season to see that. So that's where I think the expectation set is missed. I think people are still looking at, you know, 170 uh, bushels an acre corn. Um, you know, I think we might come in at 160, maybe even lower. Um, and if that's the case, uh, you know, then all of a sudden, uh, you know, the market goes from, you know, tight-ish to really tight. And you compound that with what I foresee as the resource nationalism and the hoarding at the government level, um, you know, then all of a sudden you've got a market that goes from, you know, commodity markets are commodity markets. You got a little bit extra, you know, pricing is, you know, kind of goes along and is okay. The moment you get short, um, you know, things start to get a little wonky and go to the upside. And that that's where I think grains sit. People are also trading grains from a economic outlook, much like they kind of trade oil and copper. Um, where typically, if you look at the correlation of grains to global changes in global GDP, as you would expect, it's much less stable. You know, bull markets, people eat, you know, and bear markets, people eat. They may eat different things. They may eat a little bit less, but, you know, really, you know, this secular change of people having slightly more sophisticated diets and requiring more grain to, to support that, um, that's an ongoing kind of steady up and to the right uh, kind of trend. So uh, I think. You're absolutely right. People rushed in because the potential impact on agriculture was bigger than energy, which it was. 
um, you know, all of a sudden you had a bunch of people in the market who aren't typically there and don't have long term conviction. And when the inflation expectations start to come down, all of a sudden the sell programs are like sell anything economically sensitive, energy, oil, you know, all, all the whatever it is, it all gets blown out. And uh, so that's what we saw in really kind of, I guess, June, July uh, and maybe even the of August. The broader market loved it because all of a sudden, you know, that's their cue that inflation is not a problem anymore had nothing to do with underlying supply and demand. You know, we're still liquidating global oil inventories, but oil inventories went from 100, or oil prices went from 120 to 90 uh, in kind of a straight line um, on the concern that demand will slow. So I think a lot of it has been sort of positioning driven for slower economy. I think that's particularly um, misplaced when it comes to agriculture, which is very much less economically sensitive. You know, you made me think about um, in the last few years, what I've really learned, you know, especially with this one is what the everybody's different de definition of transitory is. Um, and the other one is that what I think is a lot of times in the financialized markets or, or hedge funds, etc. Is I don't think any of these people have really um, dealt with real assets or commodity resources and or um, ever ran a company that had physical inventory and understand lagging effects. Because like, that's what you're describing. Like even right now with uh, CPI prints and OER being a third of that and how much that's gonna le lead to a lag, you know, 12 month lag in prints. And people are like, like you're saying, they just look at today in time, oh, inflation's over. Let me sell out of all my natural resources. And so there's like these really lagging effects that people don't realize when you start dealing with bull whips and supply chains and all these sorts of things. Like these are really slow moving, you know, cargo ships, but they're, but they have like volatility in between. So I can't really mix metaphors there, but like, that's the difficult part about it. And maybe that will help because you started initially to talk about it, but the, the process transition to like energy and specifically oil. I mean, we talked a little bit about nat gas, obviously, but with oil, I thought was a great quote in your latest uh, quarterly newsletter that it's a uh, it's a previously it was a market that had a ceiling but no floor but you feel that's changed now yeah yeah i think that's and, and that's something that is not priced into energy equities um what i think is and, and and the way i sort of put it is we've got a pivoting convexity in in the oil markets for the better part of the last 40 years you had some very firm things that that sort of put a ceiling on crude oil whether it was excess OPEC capacity, that they were there to be able to kind of make sure that the market was adequately supplied and didn't get out of hand on the upside, whether it was industry who had responded to higher prices by ramping up capital investment uh, and therefore having the ability to add additional barrels, oftentimes near the end of the cycle, which was absolutely, you know, the worst time to do so. Um, and then you also had demand destruction. So all of those things were there to kind of keep to some degree, a lid on oil prices uh, in the past. Now, of those three things, two of them are kind of gone. OPEC's got a little excess capacity. You could argue Saudi and UAE, maybe a million, million and a half barrels. But in a hundred plus million barrel a day market, that's not a lot. Um, industry is not responding to higher prices and is in the midst of a 10 year decline in capital spending. Um, that's effectively put us kind of a trillion dollars plus behind the ball, the money that should have been spent to increase production in 2023 and 2024 and 2025 needed to be spent in 2016, 2017, 2018, and it wasn't. So even if we pivot, even if we, you know, the, uh, the you know, current administration and uh, the oil patch you know, grabbed hands and sang kumbaya and said, let's get after this, um, it's five to seven years until you get really incremental, significant oil supply from the globe. You get some shale faster, but you know the problem is that's, and that's something that I've done a couple of different videos on, um, that's, an, that's a place where we kind of mistakenly blew through all of our good inventory really fast and really early. There is still legs to shale, but it becomes incrementally more expensive and it becomes incrementally more difficult. We're not going to add another three to five million barrels a day out of shale. That doesn't exist. Can we add another million barrels? Yeah. But then just because of the decline rates, you know, then, you know, shale goes to, you know, seven, eight million barrels a day. All of a sudden, you know, you're losing a million or a million and a half barrels. You've got to drill just to keep that going. So that's the nature of really high decline stuff. So um, so that's the upside is that so the upside is no longer capped. I, you still have demand destruction as a potential cap. 
But what we've seen in a couple of different markets is um, prices go up really high and kind of stretch the consumer's mindset as to how to think about it. You know, diesel prices went to six or seven bucks. Um, European natural gas prices are going to the equivalent of $300 a barrel uh, of, of WTI oil prices. Um, a lot of those prices are more expensive in other parts of the world because the dollar's been so strong. So again, you're kind of stretching what the consumer is good. Now that we've come back off of it, you know, the next time you go up to levels like that or even closer, you're like, yeah, it sucks, but we've kind of been there before. So I think, I think consumer abilities to withstand higher energy prices, at least on an emotional basis, are going to stretch. So, so again, most of these upside caps are now gone. Um, industry is not there. OPEC is not there in terms of the ability to bring on additional volumes quickly and easily. Um, but to, to me, it's actually the more interesting part is the floor. Uh, is is that you know you, you often had you know, again industry typically invested a ton at the peak of these cycles, and they're not going to turn off stuff once they turn it on. So you kind of Thelma and Louised your way over the end of these cycles. That happened in 1998. It happened in 2008, um, where everyone's like, oh yeah, great up cycle. You know, all of a sudden let's add a million, two million, three million barrels a day. All of a sudden they're like, oh no, prices are going to be crashing and. Uh, you know, I, I, I did this at, you know, $100 a barrel and now oil prices are 30. Um, but I still got to run it because it doesn't pay to shut it in. Um, I at least get some kind of cash generation to cover my debt. So that's how the typical down cycle has went. The additional facet that I think people don't really understand particularly well is that OPEC was always there to kind of help that along because it was in their interest. If you look at the big declines in oil prices over the last 25 years that were associated with economic contractions, OPEC increased production into every one of them. Um, so everything from, you know, 1998 to, um, you know, that was what blew oil negative was the Saudi threat to add an additional 2 million barrels a day to a market that was already oversupplied. It was in their interest because when what you do with that is you stunt Western capital investment. And it, Sure that in the long term you throw a big downside volatility at the market and that kind of stunts the capital expenditure cycle and it was successful it really worked but the question is do they need that anymore you know, western governments and politics and esg and decarbonization goals are doing that for them now um, they don't need to discourage western investment you know we're doing it ourselves by saying hey you can't loan these companies any money um, you can't get insurance for any of this stuff uh, if you're a, an oil company, you know, we're going to basically make it really hard for pensions and endowments to own you, uh, and you're going to get no shelf space in generalist portfolios. So, so we're doing their dirty work for them. Um, so all of a sudden, this, uh, you know, this guy who used to kind of, when we were teetering on the edge, push us over, you know, they don't need that downside convexity anymore to achieve their goal. And in fact, the flip side of it, you just saw Saudi come out yesterday saying that, you know, look, if, 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 uh, Iran is allowed back in and volumes are, we'll make room for it. We will support oil prices in the uh, you know, 70, 80, 90 dollar range. So if I'm right about all of this, which I think I am, you've gone from a market that had you know, sort of this firm cap and virtually no downside uh, to a, a convexity profile that's totally pivoted and now has a pretty firm floor and very little in the look, we can get a little geeky on option programs, um, but you're radically changing the skew in what the underlying commodity can do. At the same time, your realizations that decarbonization and renewables will be more slow in a way. If people were valuing energy stocks like energy was going to be unusable, uh, like traditional hydrocarbons were going to be unusable after, you know, 2030 or 2035. I think people are starting to understand that that's not really a feasible outcome. So if you are shifting the skew higher at the same time that all of a sudden you're going to have to give these oil companies value for a longer duration of assets that they will actually be viable companies selling hydrocarbons in 2030 and 2035, all of a sudden your implied option value should be skyrocketing. Um, and yet all these companies are still trading at, you know, 25% free cash flow yields and um, so that to me is the biggest market. The, the market has not shared my view as of yet 
I think they might over the course of the next couple of years. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it, that you took an asset class probably from uh, a, a negative skew to a positive skew, uh, but said more colloquially or succinctly, like you said, maybe previously the market had a ceiling and no floor, and now the market has a floor but no ceiling is a way to look at it. But then you brought up shale prices too, which made me think about um, the other even thing on top of that, if we start lingering in more complex complexity, is uh, refining capacity. And that's another CapEx problem that we ran into. And it, it right now we're dealing with crack spreads, which is the difference between, you know, that that price of a barrel of crude that you see and then price you pay at pump. And depending on what region you're in, those crack spreads exploded. And that's why people are paying, you know, a lot more at the pump is a lot of that that delta that expanded between there. But I think I may have stolen this from you. It's hard to remember. I've been reading your work for a while. It's like, you know, everybody says that the U.S. is energy independent, but it really depends on the quality of crude and the quality of the refining facilities. So we actually have to import more of like the higher grade stuff. Is that correct? Yeah, we actually we have a grade mismatch. We have inherently right. very um, uh, complex refineries, so we actually have to import the lower grade stuff. We want, mm. <coughs> excuse me, um, we want kind of junkier crudes because we've got the biggest expensive most because that's the stuff that we needed to run when we were, you know, importing a lot from Mexico and uh, you know uh, South America and places like that. Um, and uh, and all of a sudden we've got all this domestic production which is really light and sweet and you know shale oil which has lots of you know high end uh, uh, liquids and things like that associated with them. So we need to bring in some of the heavier stuff, Canadian oil sands and things like that, um, or other you know uh, South American crudes, Mayan blends and things like that, to be able to make our refinery system. So yes, technically we're still not there yet. By the way, technically we are getting closer to energy independence, but there is a mismatch in that that which we have is not which processes well through the system that we have. So we're still reliant on, you know, again, we got a bunch of that stuff from Russia too, you know, heavier grades coming out of the Urals, um, which was part of what, you know, was able to run our system well. Yeah, Europe is the same thing. They've got pretty complex refineries as well. And then there was a, there's two random questions I had when we were talking about agriculture and grains and fertilizer is one, I don't, I'm sure you followed Peter Zihan, but like, you know, one of his th thesis is that, you know, in the, when the USSR broke up, we had this unbelievable flood to the world of almost like commodities or resources and capacity. And, you know, we're seeing kind of like the tailwind of that. And then when, you know, with the crane, like when it comes to like nitrogen based fertilizers, potash, that sort of thing, um, do you have any pushback or do you, you kind of agree with his thesis about, you know, that we had a flood and that's actually gave incredible tailwinds to places like Brazil where they could import, you know, cheap fertilizer and it led to that unbelievable growth boom in Brazil and, and the natural resource side. I think you can actually make an argument that's even bigger than that. I totally agree with Peter. I think his, 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 his writing is, um, is, is brilliant. Um, I think it's not hard to draw a direct line between the lowest interest rates in modern history and the excess of commodity inputs that were created not only by the breakup of the former Soviet Union, um, but also by the overinvestment in the shale patch uh, and you know the, the half a trillion dollars that went in via private equity and got virtually no return um, on that you know on that sector, um, you know so what you had was a very extended period over the course of a decade and a half, two decades, of really low commodity prices, um, which enabled growth in many ways. Um, as you say, the development of Brazil and a lot of things, emerging economies who were consumers of those commodities benefited considerably. Um, but it, it fed this entire cycle of uh, sort of lower cost of capital um, because your energy and raw inputs had all fallen so much in price because of temporary periods of oversupply, either because you unleashed the kind of Russian beast on the world with the excess supply there, or you just overfunded things uh, like you did the U.S. shale patch. Um, and, and, and I think now we're seeing the flip side of that is that it, that led to a very low cost of capital, very low inflation, um, you know, inspired a lot of speculation, uh, you know, a lot of things that drove down the cost of many things, you know, when money was effectively free. Now we get the other side of that because we don't have another Russia. In fact, the Russia we've got may go away uh, in terms of their ability to supply us with the commodities we want. We've kind of run through the cheap, naive capital that gave us Chael. Um, and now the capital is much more skeptical and even deterred for political reasons. So 
all of a sudden, this is this is this is fundamental not just to the commodity markets, but this drives this drives everything, right? Um, so that's the way I view it. The second question was: um, Do you follow any of like Hackett's research about oceanic and sun cycles and and different weather patterns as far as on the agricultural side at all? You know, I, that's not something that I have used. I'm cognizant of it, but it, it doesn't tend to, and I, and I see it every once in a while, but it's not, it's not part of what I, I think is, is what I use as being investable um, kind of incremental information. That'd be interesting because uh, the one thing I think about, I, I don't know if it's correct or not, but I do, I, I find it interesting. And, and part of it is like, if we go through these 40 year kind of slightly warming, slightly cooling cycles, it's at the flip of those where you have the highest volatility kind of in weather patterns that can obviously dramatically affect their culturals, which we could be going through right now, but I'll get to it later. It's like that kind of like perfect storm of CapEx weather. I mean, everything's kind of like converging to like kind of maybe lead us to this maybe thesis of a secular um, bull market in natural resources. Um, yeah. The other one I, I touch. I, I, yeah, okay. just to riff, riff on that for just a second. Yeah. I think you know the guys at uh, Gehring and Rosenzweig do really, really good research yes. uh, around some of this. And Lee Gehring was on a, 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 a podcast recently where he was he was talking about that. And we we really have had ten years or more of really benevolent, very friendly harvesting weather in most of the major agricultural centers around the world. Um, and it now looks like that may not be the case when the world becomes dependent upon a continuation of you know really uh, you know easy growing conditions and, and and optimal growing conditions you know when systems break down are tend to be when they're tight and things matter i mean who ha would have had on their bingo card that you know i would be checking the water levels in the rhine and the yangtze river every day now um to help understand my agricultural and energy outputs but that's where we are and that's what that's a that's a symptom of systems running tight, so the marginal uh, sort of inputs around them become significantly more important, and things that were taken for granted are all of a sudden, um, you know, kind of paramount. And speaking of, like the Ryan and Yangtze, like how do you how are you thinking about uh, China's second wave of shutdowns from COVID and everything? Like, how is that affecting um, your ability to allocate resources or think about how the, what is the secondary and tertiary effects of those shutdowns? Yeah, I mean. I, I would say this is this is bordering on a conspiracy theory, um, but I think it's fundamentally sound. For whatever reason, China for the last year and a half has imposed a number of different measures that may have had a different primary driver, but the end result of them were to constrict resource consumption in every single one of them, banning Bitcoin mining. You know, slowing down the amount of video games that you can play that impacts all the server farms that support those 3D virtual reality games. Um, the allowance of the property sector to really kind of radically deteriorate. So there, I think there were a lot of reasons to do that, but certainly a byproduct of that is you slow down resource consumption. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of shutdowns over very modest uh, uh, illness uh, or, or uh, um, infection levels and almost no deaths the shutting down of multi-million person, um, you know, uh, areas. Yeah, all of this may be done for other reasons, but the end result of all of that is to, cons to constrict resource consumption. And I think in many ways, China may have seen this resource scarcity issue coming a lot earlier than the rest of the world did. Um, and so my base case is that they continue to kind of fluctuate in and out of rolling shutdowns because that serves their purpose. You know, their, their biggest concern is people come out of lockdown and can't get their vegetables um, or all of a sudden can't fuel their cars or, you know, can't, you can't run the factories because you don't have sufficient power because your hydro is down because the river levels are too low. So, so, so I think they're, they're trying to build cushion into their system through these actions. I think they will continue to do so. That's my base case. If they come out and say, all right, we're open for business again, I'm not sure the resource markets can handle that, quite honestly. And then I was thinking about when you're, you know, domestic hedge fund manager or investor, you're not really concerned about US dollar in general, but as soon as you become global macro or you're looking at natural resources and supply chains that are, you know, around the globe, um, now the dollar can be dramatically affect your portfolio, especially if you're okay. investing in, um, you know, certain equities that are, you know, outside the U.S. I'm curious, do you try to isolate the dollar or you try to ride the wave of the dollar or do you think it all kind of works out in the wash across, you know, multiple regions and sectors? So, so I, I will answer that in a number of ways. I, I even when I was just running a mostly domestic uh, resource fund, 
the one singular thing that I could pull up in the morning before the market opened that would tell me what direction my portfolio was trading in was the dollar. <laughs> so it's, it's always been something that you have to pay attention to. The strangest thing is that I came into this year, you know, and several of the larger macro trades that I put on to try and you know, capture volatility in areas where I think if they do well, um, that resources will be poorly or vice versa. Um, was being long a dollar. So I was long dollar calls coming into this year, um, thinking that that was a good hedge for my portfolio. They both worked. So that's not usual. So for the better part of this year, you had dollar stronger, resources stronger, which was a, a very odd beast in the world of global macro correlations. So you saw that correlation reassert itself, um, you know, as kind of, you know, after the kind of April top where dollar continued to rally, all of a sudden economic concerns took uh, center stage and you know that sold off. So um, from a broader standpoint, I always pay attention to it, you know, and, and, and you have to pay attention to it in terms of like global affordability of commodities and, and things like that. Um, in terms of trying to wean it out from my specific commodities being long and short global resource equities, I have a tendency to sort of leave it alone. Um, and, and the reason I do so is particularly like I have a lot of exposure in Canada, a lot of exposure in Australia. For those companies, they are selling products on a global stage at dollar values typically. Um, and their local costs are denominated in their local currencies. So all of a sudden you get this benefit of expanded uh, margins from a strong dollar. So it somewhat offsets what might be the pressure on commodity prices that a stronger dollar might exert. So, you know, I, I tend not to mess around with it too much unless I have a very specific situation where I'm very concerned about a currency for one reason. Quite honestly, I'm I'm relatively bearish Canadian dollar right now. I think there's a perception that it is a resource economy. Um, that's really a de minimis part of what drives Canada these days. It's really a leveraged real estate financialized economy. Um, and that, I think, is going in the wrong direction. So if there was a place where I was, I would kind of say, let's let's hedge out our risk, it's probably CAD today. Now, you, you segued me per perfectly. Is like, what I love about your portfolio is not only do you have um, these natural resource or commodity equities, but you also hedge the portfolio too because of that, that volatility inherent in those markets. And so, like you're saying, that was interesting. The U.S. dollar calls um, is a way to hedge the portfolio, but maybe not so much now. And then I was thinking about some of your other hedges, and you brought up a perfect one because when I was reading your stuff, is like you're short Canadian housing. And I'm like, how does that have anything to do with what we're talking about on the natural resource side? But you just, I think eloquently kind of stated your thesis on that. But it's like, is that what you have to do sometimes is maybe move farther afield from when you're looking at the hedges is thinking, thinking about the secondary tertiary effects of like, how do you hedge maybe a, a long play on certain Canadian mines or natural resources? Like you actually have to, you have to actually short their housing market as a hedge. Yeah, well, I think, I think that is true, absolutely. Um, I think it's even a little bit if you if you pull it up a level um, in terms of macro, but um, you know what is right now my biggest vulnerability as a long resource manager, it's that global central banks, particularly North American central banks, are more aggressive than the market currently expects. That's where people get concerned that you know we don't have a dovish pivot, you know we don't have this decline in rates that starts next year, um, and so that and and that impacts people's concerns about growth. So who would be the biggest loser from, you know, the Bank of Canada going 75 and maybe another 50 or another 75? By far, the biggest loser there is the Canadian housing market. I think the impact there is way worse than it would be for energy or, you know, or copper or anything else conception. So to me, that's a much more asymmetric way to look at it. I, you know, I, I'm short some energy select energy stocks you know, short some things in the, you know, kind of lithium space, I'm sure. So I have some, some kind of classic in, within the silo resource shorts. Um, but to me, to the real vulnerabilities of my portfolio from a macro basis, I think that the asymmetry on being short Canadian housing right now is just so much better. Um, you know, it's, it's it, it, Wiley Coyote has left the edge of the cliff. His legs are in midair and the cloud is dissipating and he's about to look down and say, uh-oh, um, that's what Canadian housing looks like to me because prices have already broken. Um, you know, you're already seeing the credit distress and, uh, you know, the personal bankruptcies uh, and the, the resetting. They reset their uh, uh, mortgages every one to five years. So no one turns out for 30 in Canada. You roll at one to five years 
and that stuff's all resetting 100, 200, 300 basis points higher. It's a huge impact on consumer spending. So the only way that I think the Canadian housing short doesn't work is if all of a sudden you see Western central banks, and particularly the Fed and the Bank of Canada, immediately pivot and start cutting rates today, which would be hugely bullish for the rest of my portfolio as well. So, you know, from that standpoint, I just think there's 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 more convexity in being short um, Canadian housing than there would be in adding more uh, short resource exposure. So, you know, the old trope is like you can get your thesis right or your timing right. You never can get both. And so there's been a graveyard of people trying to short the Canadian housing market. But did you wait till the catalyst, like you said, where it's actually starting to roll over before you put those positions on? Yeah, it's an area that I've studied for, gosh, almost 10 years now. And I've got uh, a couple of different consulting firms that I use up there to really give me the on the ground data that I feel like I need. And so I looked at it, God, six or seven years ago, um, you know, back in 2014, 2015. Looked at it, you know, shorted a little bit in it, didn't do much, but really have just been patiently waiting. That's something that, you know, age, uh, you know, kind of gives you is the ability to say, I don't have to be there today. So I really just started started shorting the Canadian housing stuff in the last three months. Um, and that's really when the fever started breaking, where rate rises started to impact the ability of these people. And when you, <clears throat> where you started to see um, people you know, trying to sell their old house, buying a new house, trying to sell their old house, and then all of a sudden not being able to sell their old house for what they needed to be able to pay up for the new house. So you had all these um, you know, sales breaking down and you know, uh, people having to go towards alternative forms of financing that are super expensive. So that was really the catalyst to get in. And I, just, I, I think we're there. Um, it, I don't know the pace at which it will progress from here, but if I had to have a Rip Van Winkle short for the next six to nine months, um, Canadian housing would be it. So, you know, we started off talking about like uh, nuances and, and everything's much more difficult or has, uh, you know, reality has a surprising amount of detail. And when you're talking about these hedges, I'm curious how you think about the trade offs from, you know, shorting single name equities to shorting indices to buying put options, maybe on indices is like there's trade offs, right? Like if you're shorting single names, like a lot of times you can get your face ripped off, right? And then your borrow costs can be high if it's a low liquidity single name. So maybe then you move to index, but the index may not have quite the volatility you're looking for as a single name has, but you have a little bit better liquidity, maybe a little bit better borrow costs. And then buying the puts, you know, then you have to get your, your tenor or your duration, right? So like, tell me about like how you think about the trade-offs between those kind of three ways of hedging and, and how you think about that across the book. Yeah, so I mean, great, great questions. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's utterly dynamic. To me, it's how do we achieve our end goal of being able to hedge out some sector risk, some broader market risk, um, some you know, country risk, et cetera, via our short and hedge book at any given time. Uh, and so, you know, you look at sort of fourth quarter of last year, it was still really in, inexpensive to uh, express that through put options. Um, implied vol was cheap. So, you know, I didn't have a huge short book, um, but I did, you know, have, uh, you know, rolling, you know, pretty heavy option positions over the course of, you know, kind of that Q4 and actually, quite frankly, into Q1, um, which was part of the way that we, we made some pretty good money. Um, as we kind of worked our way through Q1 and into Q2, and vol picked up considerably. That's where I expanded the short book because the puts, you know, options started to get so expensive. And when you go from using puts to put spreads, you know, you just you understand you're cutting off part of your your convexity there. Um, so you can you can offset some of the incremental spend for higher option prices, but you're, you're losing that. There's a cost to that. So that's why the short book um, that we use has expanded so much not only because that seemed like a more efficient way to do it, but because in some of these areas, there are very specific themes that we can play on. Again, Canadian housing is one of them. Um, so to me, another one has been the rise of the uh, sort of some of the lithium companies that rely on direct lithium extraction, which is a chemical technology um, that is, I think, really, really complicated. And the market on the multiples that it's giving some of the companies in that space um, the market is giving them credit for processes that haven't been uh, totally vetted or, uh, or commercialized yet. So, um, you know, again, I have a long lithium exposure that I really like that is not that technology. It's very, you know, classic uh, kind of spot Jimmy mining. Um, and so, 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 again, back to your question, shifting the character of the book, it's all about efficiency. It's how do I 
create the best uh, profile for, um, uh, you know, protecting my longbook uh, from the risks that I see evolving out there uh, in a way that I think the re potential rewards outweigh the risks of it. The other thing I think about, because you brought up lithium, is as you know, we run a, um, a commodity trend following uh, portfolio. And, I, you know, obviously I love commodity trend followers and I love access to these real assets. And a lot of them can trade 60 to 80 markets. But as a lot of them have gone for higher AUM, there's a lot of smaller, more illiquid markets that don't have the capacity for them to trade. So we don't get exposure to it. And I'll use like lumber as an example. Very few people trade lumber. Everybody was excited about lumber, you know, a year ago. And they're talking about I was lock limit up. And I'm like, yeah, because nobody trades it. But do you think like through your, uh, single name equities like you can get broader exposure to things like lithium rare earths um, access to canadian timber markets like so, some of those things that like a lot of people aren't trading but you can get access to single names and then once again the nuance or the trade-off is that now you're getting access to those natural resources but now you have a government so governance overlay where you have to pick the right company yep absolutely um and so for us that's the way that we use and again our my specialty has always been analyzing companies so if I can get commodities generally right, what I'm really good is find, at, good at is finding, or at least hopefully good at, is finding ways to express that via equities. Um, so, I mean, our quintessential uh, sort of example of that was tin. You know, so we were very long tin stocks uh, for the better part of the last almost two years. Very niche market, almost impossible to do uh, in actual futures. Um, but an area where there were some really inexpensive equities that if the tin price doubled, they would go up you know, they'd quadruple. Um, and that happened. And then all of a sudden, people did, you know, you built a little bit of excess inventory in the tin markets, and all, both of the stocks fell by 50 or 60%. So, you know, that's life in the, in the resource sector. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. It's that, that, that trying, to, trying to understand the relationship between where do I find the most efficient way to express a view about commodities via equities, you know, that's, that's the bread and butter that, you know, I've been developing over the last you know, 30 years. And then to me, the most important, important or exciting part of your book is your yield side of the book. And so over the past, I've always looked at, you know, positive ways to carry like say gold with like the royalty companies like the Franco Nevadas of this world or or uh, lending it out um, to the manufacturers like monetary metals does you know everybody's trying to look for like a positive carry convexity as you've called it um, but I think that's the what's most interesting about it, is like not only are you getting all these price appreciations and this I I expansion in the space but the yield book keeps increasing but once again talking about trade-offs and nuance again there's a trade-off between you know, capex spending, paying down debt, you know, doing stock buybacks versus increasing their dividend yield. And so you constantly have to be looking at what they're doing. And and it's interesting, you always talk about how they kind of feed each other. If right now they're paying down debt, that means in the future, if prices stay high, sustained or increase, they might be increasing their dividend yield in the future. So how do you like really think about predicting that dividend yield and then thinking that yield is covering maybe the downside of the prices that you're also hedging with your hedges part of the side of your book. So you're trying to get to that as close as you can to this, you know, positive carry convexity component. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's the essence of what I've been trying to do with what, you know, we've done with this fund for the last 12 and a half years um, is find assets where we think they can do all of those things, that they can grow modestly over time, um, that they can potentially improve their balance sheet, and they can also pay out an income generation to the shareholders um, that, you know, can potentially go up if you have a rise in commodity prices. So that, that's, the, that's the essence of what, of what we've been looking at. And so it's, it's a very unique conversation because every company has a different asset profile. Everyone has a different kind of reinvestment intensity that, that they have to do to make sure that you maintain that. Um, and you need to put different discount rates on different assets. You know, I've got companies that are probably going to be out of inventory in 10 years. So clearly a 10% yield is not sufficient on stuff like that. So you've got to believe that there's either more in the kitty that they can bring in um, or, you know, you need a 20% yield. So you get all your money back in five years uh, and, you know, at the tail end of it, you've got, you know, a little bit of a call option on that. Um, and so, you know, it, it also comes down a lot to management and how they communicate their dividend policy um, because you know some have gone to very regimented ways we will pay out 30 or 40 or 50 percent of free cash flow over a certain level what we have found is that the companies that get rewarded for dividends are the ones who are clearest in the way that they articulate how that's going to be paid out uh, and why you know look you have 
fifty percent of free cash flow over um, you know base capital expenditures, which is going to be this. Um, you know, things like that. And and then all of a sudden people say, All right, I get it. I get the mechanics behind it. It's not a, you know, random what the board decide this quarter or this half. Uh, and then and then and then you get a little bit better feel for it. But you know, the beauty of it is is that it, it shrinks the number of companies. If that's your focus, which is it, it is ours, it shrinks the number of companies that I have to pay attention to. You know, let's if there are you know two thousand resource companies globally. Um, the ones who are really in a position to give significant payback to shareholders and can do so on a sustained basis, it's maybe 10% of that, you know, maybe 200, maybe less. Um, you know, at any given time, I might own 15 or 20, um, and I have big positions in maybe half a dozen. So that, that to me, is the kind of magic of what we're trying to do. Uh, and it's just, you know, a lot of times it's a matter of good understanding these businesses over the course of many years. Uh, and really understanding that the message that management is giving you is one that is 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 actually that they can deliver on that. Do you think that's the biggest differentiator between you and like the commodity trend following space where they're obviously dealing with just raw commodities and prices is like not only using the equities, but then you're using that dividend yield. And, and that really separates the ability to carry this over the longer term versus the way the other, you know, the other way people try to play the commodity markets. Yeah, I mean, again, you go back to a thing like 2008 where you had resource companies that were flat in a year that was disastrous for commodities. Um, and so and that was because of their corporate structure, because of their free cash flow generation, because of their ability to improve the underlying asset value of the company opportunistically um, in downturns. And so, so, so that I do think is a, is a big differentiator. You know, look, it's a lot harder to analyze companies than it is to, well, I won't say, I won't say nothing in any investment markets is easy. Um, yeah. But it, there's a lot more work involved with really understanding the underlying assets and cash flow characteristics and durability and sustainability of those cash flows and management's willingness to be able to share that with shareholders. It's a lot of work. And quite honestly, the number of people who really pay attention in the resource space has atrophied in such a way that it's, you know, it's de minimis these days. You know, it used to be, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, every big hedge fund, you know, had three or four commodity cyclical folks. You know, now they have, you know, 25 people in tech and healthcare, uh, and, you know, maybe someone who covers something like cyclical. Um, yeah, if you think about the big funds out there, there were some really big resource managers out there in 2007, 2008, even through the kind of echo boom into 2010, 2011. But you look at the kind of atrophy of the entire sector, you know, you got someone like Pierre Andron who's now running, you know, he may be running a couple billion, but it's only because he's doubled every year for the last three years, right? You know, that's really $500 million under management that's just doubled a couple of times. No one's allocating to this space. And so the, the skill set to really understand what's going on with the underlying companies is just it's 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 just atrophied to the point where, you know, there's just there's not a lot of competition, which is just the way I like it. You know, the good news is I was stubborn enough to, to, to kind of stick out through a decade long downturn where it would have been a lot of more fun to do other things. Um, yeah, now it's now it's a little bit more fun to do this stuff. Exactly. And then the other place where we're uh, two peds in the pod is with ergodicity and the idea of, especially with your yield book, is by having hedges on when those equities start to crash and you have these convex hedges that give you a, a lot of cash on your books. Now you're able to buy back those equities for pennies on the do like pennies on the dollar or lower nab point, let's call it. But even more importantly, with your book, that is actually increasing the yield. And I don't think people are thinking about that a lot. It's like, so do you almost get excited about these pullbacks? Because you know your end client investor done well. Well, it doesn't It doesn't matter about the time on, I mean, the actual ensemble average is when they're rebalancing due to your hedges, they're gonna increase their yield book over time. And I mean, there's gotta be a point almost where the yield book kind of subsumes the actual like other side of the book in, in a way. Yeah, it's, it's so, so to me, if, if defending against downturns well, is the most gratifying part of of what I do, um, because it gives you that opportunity set. Um, you know, look, I just I don't want to make that call that like, yeah, you look, the markets kind of fell apart. Um, you know, they're down thirty, we're only down twenty. Be a great time to invest more money. What I really want to do is, you know, look, we've we've increased the organic yield of the fund, you know, from eight percent to thirteen percent because stuff went on sale. Um, you know, and we defended capital relatively well. That, that to me is enormously gratifying. I wrote in what kind of my original big macro piece, uh, 
Um, I, I wrote about Frank Lloyd Wright and the Tokyo uh, Imperial Hotel. Um, and, the, and the feeling that, you know, again, I won't go through the whole story, but he effectively built something in a way that no one thought he should in an earthquake prone area that um, survived an earthquake that no, many modern structures did not. Um, and it was because of the thoughtfulness of design. It was designed for where it was and the, 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 the natural um, environment that it was sitting in. Um, getting that telegram that said, you know, hey, your uh, hotel survived a, an earthquake that leveled two thirds of Tokyo. Um, thank you, um, you know, it sheltered many of the people in the, in the surrounding areas, et cetera that you know that that moment was very visceral to me as a fund manager because that's the role that i want to play for my investors to be able to preserve capital in an inhospitable environment is um you know that's that 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 that's where we should earn our chops that's perfect i, sh I should end there if i was a good podcast host but i, I just had like one other question for you because you know your your newsletter highlighted to me this idea i think about all the time in that if we get much more philosophical about the mind body problem, what people are really saying, like not the actual mechanics of it, but the idea is like we have a human animal nature to ourselves that's obvious that people tend to run away from, but then we have the societal nature. And that's like, to me, the mind body problem is those are always in conflicts with themselves. And related to almost, you have this bifurcation in investing where you, know, you have these long risk on cycles where us living here in the Bay Area is like, um, tech does incredibly well. So I think about, you know, during those times, those bull markets are risk on, we can get much more um, digital and ephemeral in the way we invest, but then nature always kicks back in and takes us back to real assets and being able to eat at the end of the day. And that's when the commodities kind of jump out from behind the curtain. So I'm curious about, like how you think about that trade off is like, we live in this fictitious world during risk on, and then almost during risk off, we go back to like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And so building maybe a, an investment portfolio that has a little bit of both, like this kind of emerging metaverse combined with real assets is maybe the way to, to think about your portfolio moving forward. So one of the earliest things that I kind of remember writing when I started my hedge fund back in the late 90s um, was I, I wrote something in like 99 or 2000 that said, I think we are evolving from a decade of fluff to a decade of stuff. Um, and, and, and that is actually, you, you, can, you can chart that um, uh, where you have physical assets and financial assets doing this periodic dance. And look, financial assets, the, the, the trend is up and to the right. So over long periods of time, financial assets will outperform physical assets, and that's just the way that the world is. But you get these, you know, 12 to 14 year outperformance of financial assets. And then you get these stretches of six to eight years where physical assets are where you want to be. Um, and, and, and I think that's, it, it's, it, it's a byproduct of where does capital flow when risk premiums are really low and you are being encouraged to really, you know, get over your skis and take a lot of risk, you know, that's when capacity in those areas gets overbuilt and the stuff that you need suffers, you know, atrophies that, that that's the you know, money is not spent on the boring stuff. It's spent on the exciting stuff. Uh, and that natch has a natural cycle to it. Um, you know, I, I put out a chart a few months ago that showed the percent of S&P CapEx done by, you know, metals and mining versus the tech sector. And it's, it's this beautiful inverse correlation of tops and bottoms. And when, you know, s and when tech earning, you know, tech CapEx gets to, you know, 35% of the S&P or whatever it is, and, and resource CapEx gets to under like 4%, you know, it's time to go the other way. Um, and I think what people are missing here is that this is the most extreme example of that cycle because it's been augmented by ESG and decarbonation, decarbonization concerns and other things where, you know, man, the, 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 the movements on that physical versus financial has been so, you know, three or four standard deviations that we're very early in the, you know, reversion of that process. Uh, and I just don't think many people are positioned for it. Um, I think people want to very much. You can see it in the flows this year. People are still wanting to, you know, buy the dip in ARC. I, I put out something a little while ago that ARC took in more money, uh, you know, a couple of months ago. ARC took more, in more money in a week than all of the resource ETFs had taken in all year. So, you know, clearly people are, people are not buying that this is a reversion. Um, I think time will probably tell us something different.
Man, unfortunately, we both have a hard time stop because there's so many other things I want to talk to you about it with your, you know, um, secular bull thesis, whether it's that perfect storm of CapEx and supply chains, everything we've been talking about, but we didn't even get to touch on is like these negative feedback loops between rates, releasing reserves, helping people out um, on their gas pump prices and how that almost like bolsters even more inflation. And it has the negative effects that people wouldn't even think about in the feedback loop. But that just means I'm going to have to have you on again in the near term future. So I always enjoy our conversations and I want to thank you for coming on the podcast i really appreciate it hey jason you know, anytime love your stuff and yeah you know the work you do out here is great for us as investors i always learn something um, new about expressing volatility or what's going on in various asset markets so um you know again i, I i'm at your disposal and uh, let's do it again soon thanks robert thanks for listening if you enjoyed today's show we'd appreciate it if you would share this show with friends and leave us a review on itunes as it helps more listeners find the show and join our amazing community to those of you who already shared or left a review thank you very sincerely it does mean a lot to us if you'd like more information about mutiny fund you can go to mutinyfund.com for any thoughts on how we can improve the show or questions about anything we've talked about here on the podcast today, drop us a message via email. I'm taylor at mutinyfund.com and jason is jason at mutinyfund.com or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at Taylor Pearson ME and Jason is at Jason Mutiny. To hear about new episodes or get our monthly newsletter with reading recommendations, sign up at mutinyfund.com slash newsletter. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Mutiny Fund, their affiliates or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed to not make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits. Listeners are reminded that managed features, commodity trading, forex trading and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they're not suitable for all investors and you should not rely on any of the information as a substitute for the exercise of your own skill and judgment in making a decision on the appropriateness of such investments. Visit mutinyfund.com disclaimer for more information.